Louise Bedford here, your host of the Talking Trading Podcast. This is where traders excel. Many years ago, before I got started trading, I was actually invited to a seminar and it was from a group that is no longer around at the moment, but Hudson's Research was the name. And I remember a speaker from stage saying, if you want to make it big, you have three options. You can get involved with business. You can get involved with property or you can get involved in the financial markets and he said something that I thought was very wise at the time he said if you run into trouble with property you can't sell off a room whereas if you run into trouble in the share market you can sell some shares and I have to say it twisted my entire view about how to make money and clearly most of us want a spread into all three areas but I specialized in trading and it's just been a fantastic journey but I've also got somebody here who I'm about to interview who has got that same background but he's specialized in all three areas I'm very proud to introduce to the show Jason Greystone. Now Jason is an entrepreneur at heart. Jason had his first business at 22 and I had my first business at 19. A couple of similarities there. I'm betting he didn't run his first business into the ground though like I did. He became financially independent at the age, age of 30. I left my full-time job at the age of 26. So we have got some parallels there. And he has also built several seven figure businesses. So he is a currency trader. He's a property developer. He looks after the Always Free podcast, which is at alwaysfreepodcast.com. And I'm so proud to welcome you to the show. Fantastic having you here, Jason. How are you going? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for thanks for deciding to chat with me. It's going to be a good one, I'm sure. Been looking forward to it. Absolutely. And it's fantastic that this is a simulcast. So we are not only publishing this on my talkingtrading.com.au podcast, but also on alwaysfreepodcast.com. So I love those shows. I like to turn the table on the podcast host. Now, the thing that I really wanted your opinion on here, Jason, is that so many people since the pandemic and the big fallout that has occurred from the pandemic, so many people are feeling lost. I'm hearing I've lost my mojo, I've run out of energy, I'm not sure of my place in the world anymore, and it is breaking my heart. Sometimes I'm not quite sure how to answer them when they're telling me things like this. The rules seem to have changed. The rules around making money have definitely changed. How do people get back clarity? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I've, I've had the same thing. And, and I think First of all, you're bang on. I mean, the the world has definitely changed and the ways of making money has changed. Um, I think a lot of the shock and surprise, though, that came out of the pandemic were things that people really should have been doing a long time ago, and it just kind of pulled the rug from under them. So, for instance, people were just very, very in this mindset that you had to, you had to own things or you had to put a lot of your liquidity into bricks or you had to go and show up at a certain location and i'm sure that many many entrepreneurs and business owners had it in the back of their mind oh we really should sort out this or we should make this more efficient or we should do this one day and and the pandemic kind of forced everyone to either really hurry up and do that or um or it pulled the rug from under them and and it did deflate a lot of oh, you know, this is all I've known. This is all I've known all these years. And uh, I, I really don't know where to start or what to do. And I did witness a lot of businesses try to patch up and repair something that wasn't working rather than think, okay, how can I ensure that this never happens again, you know, and move forward and innovate. And it was really those ones that kind of started to pull through. Um, because when, you know, we talk about the way that money what money's made has changed. Ultimately, we get money from other human beings. Uh, that's the only way we get money. And uh, and there's only two ways of getting it. You either serve them and, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a level where they get a, a result and they pay you and there's a fair exchange going on, or we beat them using a skill like trading, boxing, poker, golf, 
right? Trading. And um, and they're the, really the only two ways to get money because we're the only, you can only get money from another human. So when you think about it like that, it does give you some clarity and it, and it starts to make you think, right, yeah, okay, well, I, I know how to serve people. Um, I've got that skill and I can, I've got good work ethics. So then it's really just about you know, if you're really starting again, for me, it's about getting clear about your own purpose, about who you are, what you want to do, because this is your chance to reset. This is your, uh, I'm forever having conversations with doctors and lawyers and accountants that are like 38, 40 years old. And, um, and they're like, oh, I wish I always done that. You know, my parents wanted me to do this, but I wish I always done that. And then they end up reverse engineering their life, doing night school or some kind of self-education outside of work literally filling every hour of their day uh so that they can get back to doing something they should have done in the first place and and i think it kind of gave everyone that chance to go right what is it i really want to do now um and then start focusing on that if, if you can just start focusing on what you truly want to do and truly enjoy then you can you know you can make more money than than any anyone in my opinion because you you kind of don't need that external motivation when the times get a little bit tough i so, do uh, want to get back to purpose but i want to just tease out some of the things that you've said here reading between the lines one of the aspects that you've referred to is grief that people who have had this shift have a grieving process that they're going through where they're anchoring to a past that is no longer relevant. Have you seen that with your clients? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, they um, I think they, it's very easy to start going, okay, what, you know, go into kind of a victim mentality where you start grieving for the loss of something, but actually, a lot of the times what they're grieving for is something that they're kind of blind to the upsides of. So, you know, there's a lot of good that comes out. There was a lot of good that came out of the pandemic, you know, for, for many, many businesses, it was like the best thing ever. It was, it, uh, and I know it's hard for some people to, to believe that, but it was. And I, I think the difference between the people that were grieving and the people that done well is the fact that they, the people that done well saw the good, uh, so they didn't need to grieve. Whereas the people that grieve can only see the downsides. So it's it's really it could just be as simple as asking yourself some questions about you know what did I learn? What are the lessons that I learned? What 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 did the lessons? What have they earned me in the future uh, as a result of not having to have those costly mistakes anymore? Or you know what were the benefits of that thing happening? And um, you know you're going to find just as many benefits to it as you will downsides they are there and then it should just dissolve the the grief right mm, and what you're touching on there as well is the concept of loss aversion when we are making money and things are all rosy we look at our portfolio so often because we want those dopamine good feelings yeah. to flood through our system whereas when things aren't going so well we tend to shun our portfolio and we prefer to just tuck it under the bed and imagine it doesn't exist whereas what yeah, you're saying talk about it yeah it's just amazing isn't it it's it's almost like what you're saying is the beauty of the examined life that is what you're talking about yeah absolutely and and in trading you know you, you have to do you have to see the downsides in your winnings and the and the upsides in your loot losses it, you really do have to maintain a balanced poised state all the time because if you don't you become cocky uh like you know you you splash the cash you're feeling frivolous and you you, you know you you can do no wrong and that will bite you in the butt you know that will then uh you know and <laughs> and and when you're down and you feel like you're losing you can really if you if you believe that you're failing you can really jeopardize your long-term performance because you start to break your rules or you start to do you know buy, make stupid decisions and that ultimately leads to you know a uh not a flawless performance let's say 
Yes, because we're attached to those results. And your thought about purpose is interesting to me. You know, I often think of purpose as being almost like a golden thread leading you towards a desired outcome. But currently, because people have been thrown into turmoil, that golden thread is just way off in the clouds. It's not attached to anything. Yeah. And people really are finding that difficult because they're not sure of their destiny. Nation. I'd love your thoughts about how people can discover their purpose. Yeah, I agree with you as well. I think, you know, it's always there, um, but people lose sight of it. And to me, the word clarity literally just means like when I think of the word clarity, I just think of purpose because it's that guiding, as you say, that guiding thread that's that's there and present in everything you do in life. <clears throat> and the way that I was always kind of guided to think about it and 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 stay connected with it is ask yourself a series of questions so it's like what do you the first one being if you if covid happened and you woke up monday morning and another pandemic struck but you had no money worries and you could just give up work for the rest of your days what would be the first thing you did or chose to do on monday morning right and and it's like okay you might say the cocktail beach thing and all that kind of stuff. That usually comes from a place of like hating your situation at the moment, but that's not realistically what you're going to want to do forever. So what is the thing that you would choose to do? Um, what do your friends phone you about? What are you known for? What are you most reliable in? What are you? What do you spend most of your disposable income on? What do people rely on you for? Um, you know, if I ask your friends what you're, what, you know, what you're known for, what would that be? What do you take take most photos of? Um, you know, all of those kind of questions, you'll see a pattern and a pattern will emerge. It will be something like animals or the mountains or business or, you know, self-development or relationships or something like that. And the home. Right. And uh, and that underlying in all that is is a purpose that you you are here for, you know, something that is guiding you. And make and gives you kind of goosebumps on your arms when you, when you think about certain things. Those, you know, when you hear lyrics of a song, I always think if you have goosebumps when you hear lyrics of a song, ask yourself why. You know, what is that? Why is that making you have that feeling? And again, it's all tied to that that underlying purpose that you've got guiding you through life. And um, I think it's a great exercise to do. I think it's you know really really great exercise to do for everyone. Mm, I love your thoughts there. And maybe also, if you're finding yourself getting jealous or envious, shall we say, because we're trying to be highly evolved, when somebody says something that they're doing, and you can feel that bubble of annoyance within your gut, because you go, why them? Also look at the negative side of it. So what you want, but also what you don't want. How can you harness those inner feelings to really guide you forward? I've got a theory about this as well, Jason. I haven't shared this with many people, so I'd love your thoughts. Just imagine... Yeah three circles so two on the top slightly overlapping and one underneath overlapping with them all okay now the first circle i think of as passion so what are your passions you know you might love cat videos but how are you going to make money out of it for example so write down all of your passions and then also write down all of your skills now if you've got passion and skill but there's no money involved you've got a hobby have a think about where skills and money intersect if you've got a lot of skills and a lot of money coming in because of those skills but you don't have passion you're going to feel like a zombie you'll be in yeah. this half-life and it won't be fun for you. You won't be driven. You'll just be going through the motions, which so many people do at their job, yeah. just to make the money. And if anybody asks one more thing of you in that job, you will snap. So that's yeah. where the intersection of skill and money lies. And the intersection of money and passion, that is also an interesting area because if you think, a lot of people think of their boss in this situation 
where they're so excited yeah and they're making more money than you are but they have no skills whatsoever and they have no idea what you do in your role so what we're after is that interior intersection of those three concepts your passion your skill and money and i call that the bliss zone so if you can combine those three areas i feel that rounds out a purpose statement because you'll love doing it you'll have the skills or you can develop those skills to achieve those goals and it will also bring you in money which is of course what we're here to talk about today i'd love your thoughts on that i haven't actually explained my my views on this before on the podcast yeah. so thanks for uh, playing along <laughs> no it's great yeah no i i 100 percent back what you what you said as well and i, I agree with you uh, as well and i and i think that sweet spot, as you mentioned, I think if you don't have that sweet spot, you're either going to feel unrewarded, unethical or unfulfilled in some way. And um, and you see that a lot. Right. But I think when people think about purpose, one thing that they don't take into consideration is the is the reward part, the money bit. When in actual fact. Your purpose on Earth is to live a fulfilling life, an inspired life, doing the things that you want to do so that you can have, you know, that you can be the best person that you can absolutely be. And in order to do that, you're going to need to pay for some stuff. You're going to need to pay for life. Life requires cash. And to get cash, and then your job is to do make a life or a vocation or cover those expenses for doing all those things that you need, you know, the experiences that you need for you and your loved ones or whatever it is through doing what you love and uh, that's a really important key that a lot of people miss and they feel like well you know if i'm really purposeful i need to be sitting under a tree you know doing yoga or doing some chanting that's not actual reality you're going to have to actually pay for your life as well it's a big part of living your purpose on on, on this planet so <laughs> yeah i think it's brilliant yeah really really summed it up nicely and I do think sometimes when we're looking to achieve the next level, we need to work as hard on ourselves as we need to work on our business plan or our trading plan, because often our level of financial success won't overcome where we are in terms of mindset. Our mindset really needs to come first. I love your thoughts, given that you've built multiple businesses and some of these are simultaneous as well. How do you make sure your mindset keeps on growing so that your money can keep on growing? That's a great way of putting it. I always say like, never make, always make enough money that your mindset can keep up with. And, and again, it's like when you see these people, they get, if they have huge rises, they also have huge falls. You know, the quicker they rise, the quicker they fall. And uh, I, I'm a firm believer that that's because they've made more money than their mindset can keep up with. And um, you see that in lottery winners, you know, you see it in the in the uh, the Andrew Tates of the world, you know, those types of people. You see it all the time. Um, so I think that your net worth is directly correlated to your self-worth and your self-worth is like your standards. So when I talk to people about what they'd love to earn as an income, for instance, or what they'd love their net worth to be. They give me a figure and I say, okay, well, what are you currently on? And their income might go up. They might have a good month and a bad month and all the rest of it. And when you look at their income statement, you know, you can see a line across the bottom where you say, would you ever go below that? And they go, no, I'd never go lower than that. You know, what you would never do the job for lower than that. No, absolutely not. And that's what I call their standards because the goals are always nice to have and you might hit 200k a year or you might hit a million a year or you, you know that they're great to have but we don't always hit our goals but what we do always meet is our standards so it seems to be this level that is a non-negotiable you know i would not do i would not get out of bed for less than that right okay and then when that goes up and they get a pay rise i would never go lower than that right <laughs> and then so on and so on and so on and what they're doing is they're raising their standards of of their belief of what they're worth. So a great way to do that is to make sure, in my opinion, is you are in fit physical condition and you, you're happy with yourself. And when you look in the mirror, your standards are literally looking back at you and how you're settling with yourself as a person is going to be reflected throughout 
everything else externally and how much money you're willing to accept how much you know how, how much guilt you have over taking you know the money in and all the rest of it so self-worth equals net worth in my opinion mm, mm, i love it i also like that you've introduced that this is not only about money how do you know when enough is enough this is a great question i was over in dubai recently and um you know i was with a lot of, there was a couple of billionaires there i was on this yacht on the marina and there was a, a lot of very very successful businessmen and wealthy people and we was having this conversation about you know well you know we're talking about a lot more money everything seemed to be about more money more money more money and i just said like what are you doing it for because this guy had uh, the best part of a billion um and i said what what are you doing it for what what is the more money for and he said well it's just more security and and family and legacy and all and i started to think well you know i don't really care about my kids 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 like i, I it's not my my time on earth is my time on earth like i i would be more concerned about raising my kids to make good decisions themselves and then let them deal with it it's not my job to look after generations to come that's personally not what wealth is about to me it's about just having a you know having the freedom of choice and clarity so i can be a good teacher to my kids or be you know give good advice to my kids um it's not about just hustling 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 and what i saw was these people were just sacrificing living today for tomorrow's profit tomorrow's growth that never came and it was like you're just going to go and go and go and go and some of these people i was talking to were so miserable you know so miserable and when is enough enough that was my question you know when i felt like the most successful person in the room because i just felt like i had i loved my life and i was like you know uh, i was really really content um but i think you need in today's world especially looking up to people on social media and all the rest of it and all the rubbish out there you do have to exercise gratitude for one and also just keep close to what's important to you truly important to you and what do you need in your life and how much does all that cost and when you're looking at those things make sure they are things that are truly aligned to your purpose and your your values because a lot of people want the lamborghini because someone else has got it uh again that was solved by the the pandemic like there was no keeping up with the joneses in the pandemic because there was no showing off everyone had to stay at home everyone's got rid of their second car or whatever it was right they realized just how happy they were and how little they needed to be happy uh and and that's a great exercise like make sure that you're only you've got a figure in mind that is enough to pay for what you truly want in life and don't try to keep up with the joneses and that is enough you know then just enjoy the process of making that amount of money uh so that's my take on it what, what's your take yeah i like that i like that when you were in Dubai, you were able to introspectively critique that because I had a similar situation, but on the on the opposite side here, when I was in Vietnam, I lived with this lady. She was a 17 year old lass who was a tour guide and we just bonded. Oh my gosh, I just adored her. And we stayed in touch for years. And I even brought a photo of her while I was giving birth because she, she was pregnant too at the same time. I brought a photo of her into the labor ward and I said, Louise, you realize how lucky you are to have these medical facilities around you because her name was me, M-I. Me was over there in Vietnam in a shack. So she really influenced me. I remember we were walking through these villages, the Hmong tribes, there's 52 of them in the hills of Vietnam. Some of them hate each other actually, but a lot of them right. are bonded. Yeah, there's tribal, tribal intricacies there. And 
I was sitting with her in her village and her grandmother, who didn't speak any English, was sitting beside me um, chewing one of those betel nuts. So she had these black teeth. She was awesome. My God, beautiful wrinkles on this woman's face. And everybody in the village was collecting wood, firewood for the winter. It doesn't get that cold there, but they still do need a lot of that fuel because a lot of their cooking is done inside. They use the indigo vats for dyeing their clothes and that requires heat. And so everybody's collecting and they're wrapping them all up in strings. And then all of a sudden, her grandmother gave out this oh, awful shriek. It was so loud and I just about wet myself. And I said to me, what, what, <laughs> what happened? And she said, that means enough. And sure enough, everybody just stacked up the wood and then went about their business. And me explained that her grandmother has seen so many winters that she knows when enough wood is enough and when everybody wow. needs to stop. And I think sometimes we need an external voice to tell us when enough is enough because left to our own hedonic treadmill device where we're chasing, 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 and often it's chasing pleasure because we know that money is very highly associated with dopamine hits and we love that feeling. So we chase, 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 chase until our body breaks down and then we can't chase that hard anymore because we've got our own attention. Sometimes we need an external source to say enough, maybe not so loudly because that scared the bejeebies out of me. But I do like that we've got similar stories but from a different angle there. Yeah, great story. That's a great story. I think we, we all need a, a grandma to to scream in our ear every now and then. <laughs> we really do. We really do. Because you would have seen that hedonic treadmill with people chasing those dopamine hits, wouldn't you? You know, it's hard to break yeah. out of that once you're in that process. Yeah. Until I, until I was in Dubai, I mean, it was a recent trip. But I, I wouldn't say that I'm one of those chasing, 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 but it, it even me, it even made me realize, you know, it made me grateful that I, I felt really successful and I was looking on, you know, all these billionaires and, and, I, and I thought, wow, I've got it together more than them. Um, and it just made me realize. So I wouldn't say I was in that position where I was chasing, chasing, but it did. It made me think, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I'm, I've got enough. I've got enough. I, I'm enjoying the process, um, but I don't need to strive and strive and sacrifice today's happiness for tomorrow's next thing. So, mm. yeah, yeah, I loved that episode that you did on your Always Free podcast on this of when is enough is enough. And I just thought that was yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So everybody should look up that episode right now. And I'd like to get back onto trading because a lot of my people are traders. And of course you're a trader, which is fantastic. Yeah. When does trading become gambling? <laughs> trading becomes gambling on the, on the approach. So, if you think about like the market's just the market, the market just does what it does. It doesn't care about you. <laughs> it doesn't care about me. It just does what it does. So it's up to you to approach it as not a gambler. And and the best way that I can describe this is, is when I went to Vegas in 2019, I, I, I spoke at a Traders for a Cause event actually for charity. And when I was there, I uh, I, I witnessed thousands of people go in this casino every night and most of them are very random and they're all having a laugh and having a bit of fun on the on the one arm bandit and the the poker and the blackjack and the rest of it and uh very sporadic no no plan no clue just having a bit of fun and they all lost their money of course and then they go on and they go home but at the at the poker tournament table every night it was the same people and the difference between the people that are there every night on the tournament and going through to the finals and semifinals, etc., and the people that are on the one-armed bandits having a bit of fun is the approach, the plan, the decision to treat it as a business, to have a money management strategy, risk management strategy, you know, know when enough is enough, uh, when they're getting in, when they're getting out. And that's it. The only thing that makes trading risky is how you approach it and your decision to approach it as a gambler. It's nothing to do with the market or the game. 
you know, the trading game. It is just your approach. So it's very risky if you don't know what you're doing uh, or, or if you decide to approach it in a way where you have no plan or no probable outcome of what's likely to happen over a long period of time, should I say, because that's really all that matters. Mm. But when do you abandon your rules? When do you abandon your rules? Um, I mean, me personally, I, ha I have a set of rules that I you know, live by and I may optimize and tweak on a, on a, on a six monthly review or an annual review or something like that. But if we're talking about when do you, when do you, like, when do you know you're wrong, then, um, I would say that you have a rule to know when you're wrong and, and you just, you, you accept that you're wrong and that's a bad trade or a bad decision. And, um, and then you, you review and you see, okay, well, why, on a scale of one to 10, how emotional, how eager was I to get into that trade? How eager was I to, um, you know, put my money into that thing? Or on a scale of one to 10, how fearful was I to put my money into that trade? And, and, and start asking yourself, well, was I a one or was I a 10? And perhaps I should only go into trades when I'm a five, you know, when I'm poised and balanced. Um, so in terms of rules, I, I don't, personally abandon rules but i abandon trades uh where i know i'm wrong and i try to get out as soon as i know i'm wrong um but again i have rules around that so i don't personally ever abandon rules in my trading so. oh, you're speaking my language there's so many things here that i want to draw attention to firstly you have written rules and that's something that i share as well having a written trading plan is so important you also mentioned about the importance of having a review time so that it's a periodic time to review where you look at what you did well and what you could do differently and i do suggest six months is usually the sweet spot i pop it in my calendar as a recurring prioritized a date and that way I know yep. it's due and then I do it. I think also the other aspect is if you do have a trading friend or a mentor or somebody who's just a little bit further along than you are, in theory, I mean, you have to obviously choose carefully, but you can go through your rules with them and make sure that you've covered every aspect. I find that people abandon rules in a rush. So they hit something that doesn't feel familiar. And then the whole plan goes out the window and they don't look at anything on that plan related to that scenario. So trying to cover I, every scenario is so important. Yeah. I, I call it a thermostat, like the thermostat analogy where people are too cold. So they just turn the heating on by whacking it up to 30 or then they get too hot and they turn it off by whacking it down to five. And really it's about tweaking it to like 20, 21, 22, where it's just comfortable and you can sit at a desk and not get cold, or you can work in a workshop and not get hot. And that's basically your trade plan. It's like you need to tweak it until it's maintainable and sustainable for a long period of time. That's, that's how I like to think about it. I love that. And it is different for everybody because for some mm -hmm. people, they can trade the short term market and not even break a sweat. Whereas I tend to be more of a medium term person and that's my sweet spot. I know that because not only have I tried all levels, all realms of trading, but my results also betray that because when I look at the results that I stock up, from a six monthly review process, I look at where my equity curve is growing. Is there friction in the system? Is there a time frame or a market that is holding back the overall results? And what happens when I remove it? Because I find subtraction is such an important process. After a certain point, people can overcomplicate things because they think that's what's required. Have you seen people overcomplicate things in their trading? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, in fact, I did it myself when when I was. Funnily enough, I mean, I went down that whole rabbit hole that I'm sure a lot of traders go down of trying to create this amazing system, zero loss system kind of thing, and uh, you come up with rules for rules and rules' sake, uh, and you, and you become a bit obsessed with trying to create this no loss system, and um, 
what you find with a lot of traders, including myself, you go, you end up going back to the most original thing that you learn and just simplifying it. And that's, that really is how I started. I went back after about three years to something that I learned first of all, and made it profitable in a very short period of time because of the insight that I'd gained from trying to overcomplicate things. And, um, sometimes it's hard to believe that this, you know, simplicity can actually yield a return but it, in mo most of the time it can um but yeah i i see it a lot all the time all the time and it's mainly to do with that you start testing something and then you have an idea or oh, what if i did this or what if i tweak that and what if i and then you just go on this kind of snowball of uh you know if i did this and you end up with a system where you might have two trades a year <laughs> you know and you've you better not miss them because that will just be fifty percent of your your profits gone, and it's just yeah, it's not it's not um it's not sustainable. It's not actually practical to to go down that. It's much better to start to have some rules, have a system that you're okay with, and then just start you know learning and tweaking and optimizing and making small adjustments, tiny adjustments, um, not too frequently. You know, like the thermostat analogy, and making sure that you're on top of it. Uh, that that would be my kind of initial advice. Yeah, I like that. It also feeds into the concept of post dictive error. So post dictive error is where you've over optimized that system. It curve fits perfectly for the past. But then as soon as you implement it in today's market, it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't cover every aspect and you don't end up with the results that you thought you were going to get. So you want something that's robust broad enough to cover the majority of circumstances but specific enough so that you do actually end up pulling that trigger and i do think that's part of learning how to trust yourself implicitly as a trader how else can traders learn to trust themselves jason oh i mean a trust i'm a big fan of backtesting so for me as a trader all we've got to go on is probabilities and if you're just relying on psychology to drive you forward in the world of probabilities what you need is black and white proof of historical performance because that is literally all that's going to support your mind um you know you can because you you can think you know what the market's going to do all you like but you you don't know and uh, you'll never know unfortunately in fact if anyone does know let me, you know, I'll ping you my uh, account details and you can have all my money. But, yeah. but, here's, but here's the thing. If you've got tested data, at least it can keep you grounded to say, this is my expectation of what the performance should be over a 12-month period, say. I now know that August is sh is a slow month. I now, I now know that December's pretty slow. I now know that my maximum drawdown period is X amount of percent. I know that I've never exceeded 10 losses in a row, say. Um, so all of this just gives you mental stability of, and, and clarity going forward of the probabilities. Certainty, if you like. It's like, this is, I am certain that this is how it should behave. And that's all you've got to go on. So my question is, you get a lot of people saying, oh, I don't, I don't really want to backtest. But I've always asked the question, why wouldn't you? And, and other than the fact it's quite a lot of work to go and do that, I've never really had a valid response. So um, that's, that's, if you test the system, you're going to have, you know, a lot of confidence going forward. It's going to provide you with, uh, not only that, it's going to get you used to seeing the patterns and seeing the, the setups and seeing, you know, you're going to put reps in. It's like practice. So lots and lots of benefits. I'm a massive fan of backtesting systems and I've spent, thousands of hours doing it myself so yeah jason graystone you are from alwaysfreepodcast.com i have just loved having you on my show talkingtrading.com.au likewise oh how fantastic is this such a meeting of the minds how can people get in touch with you and what can they find on your websites yeah, I mean, I, I I would just love you to go and listen to my podcast, to be honest. Uh, so you're already listening to this because this is a simulcast. If I've got a new audience, welcome. Um, I would say check out episode one if you haven't and, and go through them in order because I'd kind of 
give you a bit more of an insight into my philosophies around investing and stuff like that. And I'm sure you'll get value from that. But other other than that, you can find me on all the social channels and just send me a DM. Just beware of all the fake accounts and all the scammy accounts because wherever money is involved, unfortunately, you get someone trying to make it a little bit quicker. And um, yeah, there's a lot of scams, unfortunately. There really are. It's just a shocking thing, isn't it? And for the people from Jason's site who'd like to come over to me, I've got a free gift for you. If you come to Amazing. my other website, yeah, you'll love this actually. I think you should download it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Come to tradinggame.com.au, tradinggame.com.au, and you can download my free trading plan template. That gives you the specific structure you need so that you can answer every question in relation to your trading plan. So by the time you've filled in that template, you will have a fully written bulletproof trading plan customized to your own needs. So tradinggame.com.au for that free trading plan template. And also, of course, talkingtrading.com.au. I'm such a fan of podcasts. I did binge your podcast, Jason, and I have loved it. I just knew we would have such a wonderful meeting of the minds. So I really appreciate your time. And it has just been wonderful exploring what makes you tick. So happy trading, yeah, everybody. It's been brilliant. Do rate and subscribe to both of our podcasts. I think you'll find our shared values are extremely high. Any parting words, Jason? I'll just thanks thanks again for the conversation. Thanks for the gift for the for the listeners as well. That's I'm sure that's going to get give them a lot of value. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a couple more podcasts in this <laughs> in this pot in this <laughs> conversation as well. So definitely <laughs> seems to be all right. Happy trading. Bye for now. Thank you.